From the moment you hear his voice, you know that the audience is with a unique style. Joey Coco Diaz has been writing comedy stages for 15 years. With her tongue in cheek, she's been exploring such topics as dynamics of the male-female relationships, or as we call them here in the studio, dirty thoughts, and the proliferation of the sensual feminist. She's a little firecracker rolled up, and that's why I love her, and that's why you're gonna love listening. So tune in, all right? Greetings to all you podcasters out here. Beauty and the Beast <laughs> podcast. Felicia Michaels. Joey Diaz. What's up, you sexy animal giggling over there? Oh, around. Joey. Uh, I like when you wear your little down vest. Oh, it's freezing out. I, now I can see that you did live in Boulder, Colorado. Yeah, it's that freezing down vest. Yeah. It's very cold out there. Well, yeah. You know, two weeks ago, you were sweating up a storm. It was 116. Yeah. And now, sunny California has become rainy California. Yeah, and everyone gets so shocked when it gets a little bit chilly in California. Like, dude, grow up. People it's can't 67 drive. 67 degrees. Grow up. People can't <laughs> drive. I mean, somebody <laughs> called me this morning. They're like, I'm on the 101. It's horrible. Yeah, man, when it rains, Californians lose their mind. They yeah. don't see this shit all yeah. the time. Yeah. So they react in weird ways. You had a great week this week, didn't you? You look beautiful as usual. Oh, thank you. Recovering from the flu? I'm recovering from the flu. Okay, yes. beautiful. You look good for a couple of days there. I was down for a couple of days, yeah, yeah for sure. But you still look good. You're the thank only you. one. Thank a doctor you. will come over to give you a shot. Next thing you know, he's trying to wow. fuck you. You know what I'm saying? Next time we get together, I might actually brush my teeth. That's right. You <laughs> sexy, sexy animal. <laughs> this week was interesting because... Uh, for some reason, people listen to podcasts two or three weeks behind. That's a good thing about podcasts that you download them mm-hmm. and you listen to them at your own time. Leisure, you know? yes. <clears throat> and it's funny because we had, <clears throat> out of all the weeks, we get a lot of emails and Twitters and Facebooks. We got some phenomenal emails this week. Oh, yeah. And one sure. being from a, a young man that uh, felt that I was laughing at the hooker story, you know, which was funny when I was saying it. Blah, blah, blah. And like I explained on the podcast, I can't believe there's a third episode and we're still talking about, about that poor hooker. hooker. Story, yeah. And uh, he felt that uh, he was a little angry at me because I was laughing during the podcast. And uh, he just felt that... Uh, I wasn't remorseful enough for something, something in the email. Well, I think, Break uh, it down, Felicia. I, when I read the email, he said that uh, it was very personal to him because he had an older sister that for 15 years struggled with drugs. Uh, I saw that you had emailed him because we really do try to return all the emails. And I saw that you had emailed him saying, look, uh, you know, it's something that I did and I regret it. And But I was laughing uh, at Felicia's response to uh, this terrible story. And, uh, and I had emailed him as well uh, uh, because, you know, uh, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting thing. You've moved on as a person. It's a terrible thing you did. And uh, one amongst many, we all do shitty things in our life. Some of us do shittier things than others. But uh, I know you as a person, and I know you would never do that again. And I know that when you're laughing at it, uh, it's uh, sometimes uh, it's to laugh at things because... You really can't. I couldn't believe, like, years later, like, listen, you know, you sit there, like I told on stage that night, you sit there in your bed at night sometimes, and you can't fall asleep, and you think of your life, and all of a sudden, that popped up, and you fall asleep, and I woke up the next morning, I was like, I can't believe I mugged the hooker, okay, and then I discussed it on the podcast, and I actually went home and made a call and thought about it and realized who was there and what had happened and the events towards it, and I, it's funny because I can't believe I did it. I can't believe what did I get from burning her wig? Like, what was the positive <laughs> right. result of burning her wig? But it's so funny where your head is at. You know, at that time in my life, I, remember, God takes your mother, and you hate the fucking world because you can't figure out why God took your mother. And I'm not harping on this. I'm not crying about this. This is just a no, thing I, I went know. through a for a couple of years. Yeah. When you're 14 or 15 and something bad happens, you know, you, there is no God anymore. Right. And when you lose faith and maybe... I was having a bad day, and I wanted to take my efforts off on her. If you listen to the podcast, I didn't stab her. I didn't punch her. I didn't raise my hand to her. It was just, it was a situation I got back. So I apologize to you for laughing. I'm not apologizing to you for saying the story and for doing it. Because just like your little girl there, Tina, in Streetwise, you know, she may be very nice, and she lives down the block from you. But 15 years ago, you know, bottom line is she was hooking, and she enjoyed it. You know what I'm saying? She didn't enjoy it. Well, whatever it. happened, right. whatever happened, you, you right. it happened at the time. It happened. You're laying there, yeah. and, and something calls you back. Hey, when I did blow for 30 years or 20 years, I had a good time the first 10 years. After that, you, the addiction crawls on, and you see, you know what you're doing is wrong, 
but you can't stop, you know? Right. It's not like I went from there and, and took more mu wigs and burnt them. I haven't burnt a wig since that time, you know right. what I'm saying? So yeah. I'm sorry it, if people took it wrong. Sometimes I, people I'm take things wrong. I'm sorry if you took it wrong. And, uh, but here, here's the thing. I can totally understand where he's coming from because uh, the truth of the matter is uh, I had an older brother who was uh, bipolar and a raging alcoholic, and he ended up being a street person. And I get offended when people make jokes about uh, street people or they treat them with disrespect. It, it hurts my feelings because I understand uh, the pain. The what pain got of them it. there? Sure. I, not only like if I see a person on the street, it's I don't only feel sadness for them. I feel sadness for the members of their family that do care for them, but that they can't do anything for them. Because if you know something that has men know someone that has mental illness or uh, know someone uh, who has an addiction and is on the streets you can't uh, institutionalize them. You know what I mean? Unless they're hurting someone. And that was the problem with my brother. And it was very painful for me to see my co-witness in life, uh, you know, and my brother and a person that I loved and, and looked like uh, not be able to pull himself out of that. And, and by the way, he was given a lot of help, but he just couldn't. He just was a person. And that's together, the thing huh? that's really sad about about people and that people have to realize and maybe this sounds cold-blooded not everyone is meant to succeed and i say that with the pain in my heart n knowing that my brother who died uh at the age of 38 and died in a, a hotel that my then ex-husband and i'll always say this about my ex-husband was very generous with his money who who put him in there and i would try to get him to go to shelters and i would try to get my brother to go seek uh therapy i would offer to pay it but I couldn't give him money at the same time. And it's a, it's a tough thing when you see someone floundering and it's a tough thing as a person, and you feel guilty because you're not floundering. Like, why did I get this lucky gene where I'm, you know, where I can take all this shit and move forward, but where someone who, you know, is as close as to me as he was, can't. And it's a terrible thing. So I can certainly understand your email, why that offended you. Because I personally get offended when people make all those jokes because my brother had a lot of problems. You know, this morning I was, I always listen to the podcast before I come here. Oh, the previous week's I listen to last week so I get in the mood and I talk. And this weekend, you know, I spoke about my friend George and I spoke about whatever. And I'm sitting there going, fucking Felicia, better come up with a fucking story soon. I I'm know. over here, you know. <laughs> I know. And it's so know, weird that you, you finally hit me with something that knocked me. I didn't know this much about him. And yeah, it's another thing I want you to also sad. think about that I, I, I tend also to share, you know, uh, you had a hard divorce. We all fucking do. Everybody yeah, that goes through divor divorce, divorce, and I want, and I just learned something now that I've known for a while. I was never friends with your ex-husband. I know right. him in passing, right. and I've seen the good that he does with your boys. Now he's stunned he's by a good you. Father, yes. And you know what? I know that you guys broke up for insecurity reasons or whatever the reasons were it may be. I will say this about my ex-husband: when I went through my divorce, it was incredibly painful for a number of reasons. Number one, he started having an affair with my best friend. And that was incredibly painful, not only because A, it sucks, but B, that's what happened to my mother. My father had left my mother for her best friend when I was a little girl, and her best friend since childhood. My mother was always very sickly. And, you know, as an adult, I understand now, uh, you know, they got married when they were 22, and then you have this wife uh, six, seven years in that was in the hospital for months on end at the time. Like, I, I understand now as an adult why my father did that. When I was growing up, my mother always tried to kill herself. She was in a wheelchair, you know, she did, her husband left her for her best friend. Uh, she had me as her daughter that looked exactly like the dude that did her dirty, you know what I mean? A little mini me of him, judging her constantly when she was popping those Valiums that were overprescribed by her doctor to her. And like, I, I, I understood it all came to me because here's the darkest truth. I fucking judged my mother. I honestly would, as a child, look at my mother and think, you weak piece of shit. Like, why are you letting some man crash and burn you? Like, I, that's how I saw my mother a lot, you know, because it's like, you know, move on. You got to move on. Two months after my husband and I separated and he was having an affair with my best friend, and it was ugly, I was so angry and so pissed off and I was at the Beverly Center, I swear to God, and I had, and I was on the third floor, and I had my hands over the rail, and I was like, I should just jump over this rail right fucking now, 
and just be like, fuck it, you know? I'll kill myself in front of BCBG and red will be the new black this season. I mean, I was pissed. And then, Joey, I had this moment where I was like... It came full fucking circle. It came full Coast, circle. Coast, and full like, fucking Whoa, circle. Oh, my mom didn't always try to kill herself because she's a weak piece of shit. Maybe she tried to kill herself because she just wanted that anger to go away. That anger that fucking eats away at you. Maybe that's what she just wanted to go. Because that's what I wanted to go away. It wasn't like, I can't go out and get some more dick. Because, you know, quite honestly, I already was doing that. But I was just so fucking mad at him that he was, that he couldn't see the forest because of the trees. You know, that he was doing, he was putting the pain that I experienced and putting it on my children. That's what made me so upset. And, and it was a full circle thing. Like, and now I, when I look back at that, look, I'm never going to kill myself. I'm a narcissist, you know, it's, you know, but I had that moment of weakness where I actually thought that. And I was actually like, wow, this is my life lesson. Like I really judged my mom and I judged her wrongly, you know, not, and by the way, judging people, I don't think is that bad. That's what you do. You're a person, you're a human being, you're an individual. That's what you do. But, but you don't, I think people tend not to judge uh, the right way. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, and I understood at that moment w when that happened, like, wow, my mom just wanted that terrible feeling to go away. And it wasn't a feeling of love loss because I wasn't in love with my husband anymore. It was just the feeling of why can't you do this the right way? You know, like we don't have to be together forever. I'm the one that left. But why did you, you know, choose to do this thing so dirty when I was trying to do the right thing, you know? And so uh, it's, a, it's karma, you know, it's karma. It's funny because this week I always write a blog in MySpace every Monday it's, as a writing exercise. And I wrote about uh, the hooker. Mm -hmm. And I wrote about how karma even worked itself out with that, even before I got the email from our boy here, I thought about how when she was laying in the car sideways, you know, and she was yelling, you know, I, I don't want to go to Jersey. I don't want to go to Jersey. But it's funny that when I got convicted of that drug rip, it was kidnapping. And I always, I didn't think about that till I said it on stage at Sal's that night, that it hit me that that kidnapping I got charged for wasn't the kidnapping of that drug dealer, it was for that hooker. It made me open up my eyes because... I remember when I got convicted of that, I thought of that. I go, this is for all the sins I did. I didn't really kidnap nobody. I always thought kidnapping was, hey, I have Felicia, give me $10,000 right. off. I'll fuck her in the ass with Adam and Eve toys. You know what I'm saying? Right. It wasn't that. It was, uh, it was uh, moving somebody from one dwelling to another without their consent. Right. So karma is very, and, and I like that. Karma plays a big role in this podcast. We talk about it a lot. It comes back to... Uh, bite us in the ass and sometimes look at your email whatever was negative or positive it was positive because you checked me uh created this got this little story out of you your brother that he was homeless i never knew that yeah i always knew your brother it it's so weird like uh, i go to 7-eleven all the time you know i'm one of these guys and i see people outside and i can't give them all money but i i i, I see them and i give what i can you know and it's so weird that I remember even Sacred Heart School for Boys. I got thrown out of there for choking out a nun. But I remember what one of the nuns used to always say, that that could be Jesus coming up to you in disguise. And that someday yeah. when you die and go to the pearly gates, that same old man's going to come to you and say, remember that time you didn't give me a fucking quarter, cocksucker? Guess who has the control for you to go into VIP, bitches? <laughs> uh, I have a great wife, and I love her dearly. Dearly, I love my wife. I would give my life for my wife. A lot of people don't know that. I love my house. I love everything about my wife. I don't want to have no kids. Right. You know, she doesn't understand that. And, and I'm like I tried to explain to her the other day, I'm 46. When the kid's 20, I'm 66. That's supposed to be the twilight of my fucking life. That's supposed to be the time when I'm supposed to relax. Now I got to put up with fucking Junior Mafia and Biggie Smalls in my house. I, you know, you have no fucking idea. Oh, my God. I but, see, Joey, you have you've no had idea. enough Twilight. <laughs> you know what I 
<laughs> you have no fucking idea how much. Look, my buddy right now is going through hell. My uncle Mike, he had to put his daughter in a fucking insane asylum. Aww. Ten years ago, this girl was a beautiful girl coming out here to be a model. She ended up smoking that speed. She can't get off. Six rehabs later, she became yeah. a Jew. She's gone through a thousand fucking things. And I told Mike ten years ago, grab her, give her 200, shake her hand, just like the dude did in Henry Hill. Here's 200. Do what you need to do. You want to get high? I got high till I was 40, but I put it into my life. You can't get high on other people's fucking nickel. And now he's in hell because he's like, Joey, I should have lived. No, man. Kids got to learn their own fucking lessons in life. I know, but that's... It's horrible. That's, it's horrible. That's I don't have the time say. right now. Yeah. I could be a great fucking uncle, and I always knew this after I had my daughter. Once I had my daughter, I knew it was too close to home for me. I didn't like it. Yeah. Felicia. To this day, I don't like it. I'm a great uncle. I'll fight for your kids. I'll kill for your kids. You can bring them over. I won't smoke dope in front of them. They'll tell you I'm the best fucking <laughs> uncle they've ever had right. because I'm a big kid. I know how to get the kids. Right. I understand how to talk to kids. Listen, you can't do this. Your mom, you want to play this. And kids will say, oh, because they won't listen to their parents. But that's because parent. you're a step away. Yeah, because yeah. I'm a step away. Yeah. But as far as a parent, I don't have it in me no more. I yeah. didn't have it with my, I, I didn't have it. I'm a fucking failure is that. And I'm not ashamed to admit it. I don't have it. Right. I don't have but it. But that's okay to say. Like, I have a, a couple of friends who, uh, women who ha uh, had a lot of men in their lives, and they were just like, you know what? I'm not the Marian type. I'm not, gonna, I'm not that chick that's going to squeeze a kid out. And you know what? Now they're older and getting closer to retirement, and they've had great lives, and, no, <coughs> and they don't regret it. I feel I, bad I for my wife. Oh, you do? I know she would be a great mom, and I know it would change she would her life. Awesome She'd be an mom. awesome mom. I don't want the woman to wake up when she's 65 and say, this fat fuck. Didn't give yeah. me a kid, you know. And I don't think my sperm works anyway. Uh, what? <laughs> your sperm comes out I of think, your dick I think like it's going through a colander with all those holes. Years ago. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you I think, think my so? Oh, yeah. Really? I don't think there's any. I tasted it about a year ago. It tastes you funny. You tasted it, your own sperm? Sure, it tastes like fucking You ink. tasted your sure, own sperm? Sure, it was on your hand. And you don't How know what it is. How did you get to where you tasted your own you sperm? You bang one out and you leave some on your hand and you just fucking give it a taste and like see what... Your tongue was closer than the sink? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't fucking know. <laughs> we'll be back after that little whack off story. <laughs> at Beauty and the Beast podcast. Email us at gmail.com. Coconut on it. <laughs> yeah. We'll be right like back how you after like this. Your yum -yums. <laughs> By the way, if you would like to email us, please email us uh, uh, with any kind of ideas or if something pisses you off that we say or if you. Uh, like what we're saying or if you actually can also email us a video file a small video file or an audio file of a story uh, that happened to you that you would like to share uh, and think might uh, be beneficial for others to listen to uh, please email us with anything we got some good emails this week. We got some clips. We got some Bruce Lee stuff. Yeah. Oh, man. Sent this. I tell you what. I want to give a shout out to a couple people before I get into this. My man, Ollie Boys down there in Australia, put a Twitter up the other day that every day is tough for him. The only thing that keeps us him alive is the fucking podcast and a couple really? other things. Ollie wow. Boy, hang in there. Do not take a fucking swan dive. Beauty and the Beast podcast will not let you take a swan dive. Hang in there, brother. It gets better. Trust me. Yeah. And if, uh, if you're really feeling that way, please... Uh... Seek help. And my man Dan, who said he was thankful that we put the hooker story in. Yes, he uh, he liked the hooker story. And and I tell you, I was sweating it whether I should put it in or not. But uh, well, as you were telling it, you were like, you better put the story yeah. in, bitch. <laughs> and my man Dominic, another email we got. And Steve-O, we love you. And my man MMA UK blog over on Twitter. He just started listening to us. He's a college student. Very Always nice. a shout-out to my man James Marsh, who listens to it every week. And a newcomer, we got Tanker101, who we picked up from the... Gary and Dino's show. He gave a shout oh, out on Twitter. Nice. So thank you for coming very on nice. and welcoming. You know, also like to welcome our host, AdamandEve.com, with yeah. the best shit out there. I seen the commercial this weekend. So Adam and Eve they're is not, the real fucking, fucking deal. Around. They're not fucking around. Yeah. After I seen the commercial, I ran and I looked at the web page. Let me tell you something. They got some shit on there. They got some. Interesting they got some stuff fucking on crazy there. shit yes. on there. They got some sex toys, vibrators, lingerie. They got lubes, lotions. They even got supplements you can rub on your dick and it grows into look like fucking uh, Avatar or something like that. <laughs> they ain't fucking around over there, beauty. They got cyber shit. They got everything. Give them a shout out. Go over to adamandeve.com, right, Felicia? Adamandeve.com. And you get, if you, whatever you order, you get 50% off. Yes, you get 50% off. Plus, you get three movies. 
and a very sensual surprise. That's right. Plus, present. you get free shipping. Free shipping. And all this on the bottom of the order, whatever you order, whether it's a yes. little dildo, they even have little firecrackers you put up your ass, and you can press a button and massage you like every 20 minutes really? in case you're addicted to fingers up the muffler. They got everything. Wow. They got everything. They got a fucking like a rabbit thing. I looked at everything. You Not did. that I would use it, but I wanted to see what the fuck was going on. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So look them up, adamandeve.com. They're a great sponsor, great people to do business with. In the promotional code on the bottom, just uh, put Felicia. That's right. F-E-L-I-C-I-A for you dumb fucks out yeah. there that don't know how to spell or don't. Watch Sesame Street. You know what I'm saying? We're starting to finish each other's sentences. We're like twins, but Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is good. This is good. <laughs> I like that correlation and shit. You little dirty bitch. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Man, Saturday night, I went to do a Rudy's Baja Grill. Rudy Moreno was there. And Rudy's a comedian, but uh, a lot of people don't know that a lot of comedians are really uh, closet musicians. First time I met Rudy Moreno, swear to God, he said to me, don't tell the cops anything. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to tell the cops anything, Rudy. God, I really look that white bread. <laughs> so uh, it's funny because he gave me the CD, Rudy Knows My Love for Music. And Rudy did it, opened last year for George Santana. And I said to him, do me a favor, Rudy, get me a, an autograph because George Santana is who did it over at Tone. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Rudy opens for him every year. Rudy's like, please don't. He does? Yeah, he's like, please don't make me talk to that fucking scumbag. Rudy opens for George and for War every year at the, at the Egyptian oh, and all this cool. other shit. Very cool. He knows the guys from War. He knows all the guys. They come to all his shows. So Rudy uh, knows my love for the Santana brothers. And he even got me the autograph. And he said the guy was rude to him. That really? uh, He goes, George, hi. Uh, my friend, he's a Cuban kid. He wants an autograph. He's a real fan of yours. And the guy looked at him and goes, yeah, 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 the funny All-Stars. Give me the fucking thing. And he really? signed it and he gave it to Rudy. Rudy gave it to me and I ripped it up. I really? fucking ripped it up. Yeah, Rudy knows how music. We're both into music. We call each other on Saturday and ask each other what you're listening to. Because yeah. I rolled the blunt of death on Saturday after yoga. And uh, he gave me this copy of Santana's covers, which I heard about. I heard that it was getting released and no big deal. and But I did hear that for a whole lot of love, they had to get Led Zeppelin's permission and Led Zeppelin had to make sure who the fuck was singing on it. But they got Chris Cornell. That is one of the beginning songs. The second song is with the singer from uh, Slash's band, Wheeland. They do a... Wyland? It's not yeah. Wyland? Yeah. Really? He sings uh, the, the, the Rolling Stones song, Can't You Hear Me Knocking. Really? The fucking third song is Rob Thomas, uh, I've Been Waiting for So Long. But the album is stolen by India, Yo-Yo Ma, and Santana doing... Uh, as my guitar gently fucking weeps. It's wow. amazing, guys. I'm going to definitely go Yeah, if you that. get a minute to download or whatever great for you old school music people. And they have Nas doing ACDC's Back in Black. Really? It sounds funky, but you got to give them credit because they went outside the box. Right. You know, you're like, what the fuck is this? But you're like, this isn't bad. Another jam that I heard that wasn't bad. At first I heard it and I was like, eh. And then it grows on you. It's Photograph. Def Leppard. Oh, yeah. Photograph. Yeah, 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 they do that. They do a couple of neat jams. If you like music and you like uh, I'm definitely Carlos go Santana, listen to that you know, I'm a that, big yeah. fucking. I've been listening to a lot of music lately with this shitty weather. I've been really getting into it again. I've yeah. been getting into some weird shit lately, though, you know? Right. I've been getting into the B 52s again, the first you album. You saying that, yeah. Yeah, I like all that weird stuff. The Clash, London Calling is a bad fucking oh, album. Yeah, I was, yeah. And for some reason, I listened to the Who's Quadrophenia yesterday. Wow. And that's a great fucking album. Can you see them real me? Can ya? Can ya? That is yeah. a fucking jam. So for you music lovers, you're always complaining that we don't talk a lot about music. or I get a lot of emails. People are like, you guys don't talk about music. Well, by the way, uh, I think one of my favorite versions of As My Guitar Gently Weeps was is Prince, Prince yes. when he did the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame home, as you would say. Tremendous. Tremendous. I like, like when people know other music. Yeah. I like when a musician could cover everything because that shows you that growing up he listened to this. He's not just some fucking Johnny come lately that grew off one thing. Right. Like I tell you, a lot of people like him and don't like him. Kid Rock knows everything about everything. You can't, you put Chris Rock, uh, whatever Chris Rock, you put a Kid Rock on Jeopardy, he'll fuck your world up when it comes to music. He knows country, he knows opera, he knows rock, he knows black music, he knows soul. That's a real musician. They borrow from right. everything. You know, these guys that come along. When I listened to the Santana thing, it gave me faith again in music. 
I lost a little bit oh, of faith wow. recently yeah. in music. Just there's some bands that are doing the same shit. You know, I'm older, so I see it now. You right. see the move, you know. And I'm sure younger guys are like, hey, Judas Priest suck. But it's so weird that this Santana thing gave me a little bit of hope. I like music a fucking lot, you know. And by the way, just the fact that he is still recording, I mean, is uh, pretty amazing that he's still uh, trying to think outside the box. Well, people can't sense. figure out. People always say Santana, like a buddy of mine said, you know, we never figured out why Santana wasn't bigger. Well, the problem was he never had a lead singer. That's a big fucking no-no. Like, he needed somebody there for a couple years just so they could really connect. He always had different... Have you ever heard Santana sing? Santana was my first concert. Let oh, me yeah, tell yeah. you, in Pueblo, Colorado. Oh, fuck This yeah. is a true story. I had this boyfriend named Peter Trujillo when I was 16 years old when I lived in Fountain, Colorado. And Peter took me to my first concert. And by the way, if I don't think Peter's listening. Peter is... Uh, he is a, a scientist of some sort. He tracks the trash uh, in space. Like for when the shuttle comes in, he's one of those guys. And... Uh, or was, and he's like a professor now, I don't know, some shit. But he took me to my first concert, and he was in college already. He went to USC and Pueblo University of Southern Colorado. And uh, and he took me to my first concert in Pueblo, and I remember being at that Santana concert, the only white person there, and being like, whoa, this is awesome. You know, and then we went to a motel, and we had a lot of sex, and he pulled his groin muscle. But he's a great guy, and he 16, took me to my yeah. first concert. I went to see Santana a couple times, and I went to see him with Public Enemy. Oh, yeah. In uh, Public Enemy and somebody else that was fucking crazy. Grateful Dead. Shut up. I went to see Grateful Dead's Public Enemy and Santana at Red Rocks in like oh, 1990 yeah. or 91 or 89. Right. And it was just amazing. Carlos was great. The Grateful Dead was always fucking yeah. great as usual. You know, I lived in Boulder in the heart of that. I never knew anything about the Grateful Dead until I moved to Colorado. And then, you know, I wasn't gonna about to live on a bus and stop taking showers. But I liked the dead. <laughs> I like it. I, I like the fucking dead and put patchouli juice on my balls and stink like that. That ain't me. But right. I like those dirty chicks patchouli stuff. Patchouli juice. Oh, I love those little deadhead chicks and shit. The little monkeys smell like an yeah. onion and shit. As oh. you say, the back of their heels are all dirty. Oh, and they're all dirty. I love those little dirty fucking Stop chicks. Stop touching yourself as you're talking but about But only in Boulder. Joey. Only I in that. Boulder. I see that. I see that. Stop it now. Oh, in Boulder, those little dirty hippie <laughs> chicks. Stop it. Tim from Australia uh, emailed us. It was a great long email. Uh-huh. <coughs> Excuse me. Hey, I got a pubic hair stuck in my throat from last night. And uh, <laughs> and uh, every once in a while, just one stinks in there like a fucking, when you talk, no, it's like I a wind you. sock. You I know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's really weird. This guy wrote a great email, you know, great compliments, the whole thing. But he wrote that there's a different side of the coin. He goes to all your stories of criminality. They're all funny and we know about them. And that you've only heard the fucking core. You know what I'm saying? There's thousands of more. He wanted to know if I had problems sleeping at night. If I ever sit, you know, what I'm really thinking, what my conscience has let me, uh, you know, yeah. whatever over the years. And it's really weird. It's a great question. What were you going to say? Well, no, because that was when you shared the hooker in the wig story. That that was like, to me, the same question. Like, doesn't that bother you, Joey? Like, it's funny. But, you know what I mean? Do you ever think about... Deep down inside. Like, yeah. I think we went over the hooker thing. Like, uh yeah, let's put that I mean, to bed. I mean, it's 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 everything. Like the little stories of, you know, when we robbed drug dealers, and you know the story I told you yesterday. We used to go to the kid's house, and we used to leave his window open, and then we'd all go out, and then we'd go back and steal his coke. I Joey mean, totally went around my house and was like, "Dude, you got to fix this window. You got to cut these bushes. You got to, you know." I'm like, oh. "I'm like a fucking security guy because yeah. I know how oh easy it is God. to go into a house. I see the things yeah. that people leave." And I know the things people prey on, you know. This you guy write, will sit behind a bush and jerk off to you while you're cooking. Yeah, you, cook you don't need bushes. that shit in your life. And it's so weird that we get all those things. But, you know, I rob drug dealers. And, and in my mind, how I learned to cope with it was, you know, they're doing something that's illegal. So I'm doing something that's illegal. So they have it coming from them. That was, but that's not a really good way of looking at it. That was my answer for years. That's not really a fucking great answer, especially with the life I've lived and the opportunities I've had to come out with. I was a confused kid. You know, I'm going to wipe it off to being a confused kid. It wasn't because anybody's death or life or whatever. I was a confused kid. And when you're a kid, that's what it means to be young sometimes, is to be fucking confused and to try different things. You know, I was coming up in an era where cocaine was everywhere. I mean, 60% of my stories are cocaine involved. I just told you one when I dumped two ounces of coke down the toilet. That was a great story. And you the, guys should just hear the stories that don't make it on the that podcast. That don't make it. And, yeah. and I'll tell that one at the end of this. And, and Tim, it's a great fucking question because... As a Catholic, I live in hell. And as a human being, I live in hell for the things I did. But I've always been very insecure. If you know anything about comedians, insecurity and pain is what fuels us. 
That's the fuel to fucking the comedian. That plus pain equals comedy. You know, seven out of ten times. Not always. Seven out of ten times. Sometimes people end up homeless. Sometimes yeah. people end up with some people who have a little something left. You know, that's what I've always been insecure. From the minute I got to New York from fucking Cuba, when you come off a fucking boat, you're always insecure. You know, you 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 want to be an American. You you know you, you you don't know what to do. I see. I go to Langers on Mondays to meet my uncles, and that's a very high immigrant area. You know, uh, Mexicans and, and and South American countries, and you see these people, and they're doing their thing, but they're working on a dream. You know, right. and for years I worked on that dream, and then mm. when the dream popped. I was lost, and, and it's weird. Uh, this kid that called me this morning said to me, he goes, you were always a stand-up guy as a kid. You always took the blame for everything. You always stuck up. You know why? Because I had nobody at home. You guys did. I didn't want you guys to go home with a story that you got busted with a Coke or something. I always took the breather feet because I know the pain that brings to a parent. I didn't have that. You know, right. I didn't have that. So to get back to the question, it, it's just, uh, yeah, I live in a little bit of a hell. Sometimes I'm standing, you know, sometimes I'm standing next to these celebrities who people know about or read about. I'm sitting there going, if this guy only knew that I used to break into houses or that I, you know, handcuff somebody or that I even lit a wig on fire or I beat Is up a nun. Is one, uh, in one person in, uh, that you think about that you have a lot of, that you kind of sweat over that maybe you scared the shit out of them or is there one person, person that you have? A lot of guilt over it. Something There's in particular. one particular family that it eats me alive because when I was a kid growing up in North Bergen, uh, we were in a band together. We had a lip syncing band, and I fired <laughs> them as the singer. We used to sing right. Michael Jackson songs and Beatles, and and we fired him as the, as the bass player. And he he was my friend. He, I would go to his house on Wednesdays and eat spaghetti, and I would let him ride my motorcycle. We were friends. And then one day a situation happened. My mom made me get into a fight with this kid that was older. And John was still hurt from the band, so John fought me. John was a great kid, and he came from a great family. And when my mom died, I, I had choices of where to live, but I went with them because they were very lenient on their kids. They were always out playing cards or, you know, bingo on the weekends. You could walk in whenever you want. Me and John had no curfew when we were kids. John could call me at 2 and go, come over. You know, so I moved in with him. And uh, the, the dad really loved me. The dad was a man's man. He was a Hoboken dude. He was Lithuanian. And he fucking loved me. I mean, I could do no wrong in his eyes, you know. But the mother fucking hated me because he was bringing a kid into their house. He felt, the mother felt that you're not even a fucking father to your kids. He was very cold and to the point with his kids. And I moved in with him, and he loved me, and she would say little things to him, like, keep your eye on him, this ain't right. And he would say, fuck it, he's a great kid, Coco, you know. And I, I, I got a job at Rendell Lumber, and I, and I robbed Rendell Lumber, who were friends of his. Like, I had a, a sheetrock scam that I would sell sheetrock out of there and sell plywood. And uh, he found out. You know, he found out about all these things. He was putting a roof on over my head. No rent, no Social Security from the government. He's just a guy. It's like you. One of your right. friends, one of your kid's mom's dies, friends. And you tell the kid, you're living in my house. Don't worry about money. This kid did all these things to me. And what did I do with it? Instead of working on my grades and stuff, I went out and stole and sold drugs and fucked around and took it for granted. Then in 81, I got into a problem with one of their other kids that was a cop. Me and him were kind of crazy together. And the uh, internal affairs was investigating him. And this Jimmy Bender had to come to me. I never forget. It was the day Reagan got shot, 81. And I'll never forget, he came to me, he goes, you got to leave my house. And he was crying while he told me this. He was fucking crying. He goes, you got to leave my house. And he goes, I'll give you money to get set up, whatever you need, but you can't do this to my son. You know, he's a cop now. And, and it was really weird that I moved away and I kept in touch with him. And I would call him when I needed money and I would go down there. But the mother always hated me. The mother fucking hated me. So I took that hate from her and I did things to their family members that was kind of wrong growing up, you know. And... When Mr. Bender's father died, I was out getting high. I was 82. And I called him. I go, I'm not going to go to the wake, but I'm going to go to the funeral. He goes, no problem. Well, I got fucked up that night and never went to the funeral. And I never spoke to him again from the shame. I just never called him again from the shame. And he died of cancer. And I never had those things to tell him. I never really said, hey, I'm sorry for how I acted in your home. You opened Why do you think you did that, though? Why do you think that when someone gave you the opportunity... <laughs> Uh, to lead a straighter uh, type of life, not a perfectly straight life, but uh, nonetheless. I was young. I yeah, didn't but know. No, I, 
I, I didn't know. I didn't know at the time. I was angry at the world when, 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 when you think God did something to you, took your mother or a brother. You know, he took this kid from us in the eighth grade who I was friends with. Then he took my mother. I, I didn't know. I didn't even believe in God no more. I had no belief. My central belief had gone away. And I was just reckless. I was just a fucking kid. Did you feel guilty in the moment of doing st stuff? At times. At times I didn't. I was trying to prove myself. I, you know, I didn't know. I, didn't, I, I sit now and I think about it like, what was my state of mind? My state of mind was at the time was fuck the world. Well, let me ask you this. At what point in your life, what shift happened to you? At what point in your life where you started to have a little bit more of a conscience when it came to other people's? 25, 26. After I went to prison that time, <clears throat> I understood it. And I understood. I, I always understood. What made you man, understand I didn't break it? Was it just houses. going into prison? What made you understand it? Um, looking in from the outside. Sometimes you have to back up and look in from the outside. And I couldn't keep living my life like that. But I was always a little street hustler. I always knew how to make a buck on the street. I always knew how to wake up on a Friday and go, Felicia, we got no money. But I got to do some shit today. So I'm going to go pick up 100 quaaludes at 4. At 2, I'm going to go look at this guy who wants to rob a truck. And at 1, we got this Coke dealer we're going to rob. And that was my day. And I sit back and think about it now. I think about the crew I hung out with and stuff, like the hooker story and the other stories I tell. And I think about those guys. I think about what they think about. Like, out of all those guys, I talked to maybe three or four of them. There's one guy that will not talk to us. He actually told me to my face that I did some bad things when I was a kid. And it was your guy's fault. And, you know, he's a big shot now at UPS. And he makes a ton of money. And he was like, but all those other kids, we think about it. And like I told you, there's times I'm sleeping with the mask on. I'm laying down at night. And I'm, <gasps> I can't believe I fucking did that. Right. You know. Well, I know uh, <coughs> for me, like, I remember when I was stripping at the Peppermint Lounge, and I think I might have been 18, 19 years old, and I was like, I, you know, this is not what I want to do. And this is before I no, did comedy. And I went and got a job as a hostess at a restaurant. And, uh, and, uh, and it was a restaurant where the waitresses were really young and pretty, and they made a lot of money, and eventually I was hoping I would get to make uh, – it as a waitress, you know, because they made a hundred bucks a day doing tables, and uh, and I remember I worked my ass off for the owner, and and then the owner one day came in and fired me and said, "You, I don't want you working here because I know that you used to be a stripper," and at at that point it hurt my feelings so bad that that someone thought so little of me, and then I was like, "Well, fuck this," you know what I mean? And then it then it was then the other Felicia came out and then it was like, I'm going to go back to strip it. I'm going to fucking do comedy. I'm going to do whatever the fuck I, like, fuck you. But it was the judgment of this person that I had worked my ass off for to try to get something that where he would, that he just thought I was just the dirtiest piece of meat. You know what I mean? Like, like he didn't know my story that, I, you know, I couldn't live with my mother because she would have gotten her housing taken away and that, you know, she was constantly trying to kill herself or that I was trying to just get by, you know, or that I'd been married to a man that beat me up, you know, like, like, it's just when someone looks at you with judgment, do you feel like, were there people that, you know, the, the wife that didn't uh, uh, care for you at all from this family, like she, you felt like she could really see who you were even? Yes. And th that she, made you so Since day angry? one, since yeah. day one, me going to their house, she was always apprehensive towards me. And I wasn't even a criminal. Then. It was a sixth fucking grade. You know, I had a motorcycle. He didn't. The deal was he would ride my motorcycle and I would eat spaghetti at his house on Wednesdays. They had three boys. I knew all three of them. I got along with all three of them. One of the boys taught me one of the biggest lessons in life that I live by today still. And what is that? Uh, we were doing, a, I was at a sandwich shop in Hoboken. And he goes, I got to work 20 hours a day, Cokes. He taught me how to gamble. Jimmy Bender taught me how to look at lines. But he also taught me... Uh, we were, I go, we've well, got all these fucking people applying for this job. And he took the application. And he goes, look, uh, there's a box here. And it says in this box, if it's not checked, not to check it and not to write in it. When you go for an application, it says name, address. Right, and then right. there's a oh, box yeah, that yeah. says, if the box is checked, answer those questions. And he would say, I don't check the boxes. And people answer the questions. I don't look at the applications because if they can't do that, I don't want them around. Right. If they can't listen, 
I don't want them around. I always thought about that. Until this day, I make people let. That's why I want to do the podcast. Because yeah. I like when people listen. It's very big to me to listen, to learn, you know. Uh, well, that's why I like doing the podcast. Because when people ask me, what's the podcast about? And I said, you know what? Uh, there are so many people, and I've said this before, walking around in legitimate society that got there through an illegitimate means. And I felt all my life growing up that because uh, we lived on welfare and my mother was in a wheelchair, I always felt like people uh, treated me. You know what? I didn't always feel that way, but I had an experience once when I was like 12 years old. I got to go to some city camp <coughs> in Colorado Springs uh, where they had it like a day camp. And they had older uh, kids being counselors, like 17, 18 years old. And, uh, and by the camp, one of the older kids lived in a house, you know, a couple blocks away. Uh, and it was a really nice house. Like, to me, looking at it now, it would be just an average house. But because I grew up so poor, and at this camp, it was all my friends who were also very poor. A lot of them, uh, Hispanic descent. It was in Fountain, Colorado. Uh, where we came to Colorado Springs to do the camp and the kid took us to his house and he was just going to pick something up and he kind of took us on a little tour or whatever or his playroom in the basement and we were all like whoa these are rich people I like looking at it now no and, and I remember as a collective group uh, there were like six or seven of us from my little town as a collective group some we came upon this conclusion and one of the kids I was with said it they said we need to stop saying you have such nice things because they're going to think we're poor and that we're never going to have nice things. As a group of 12-year-olds, boys and girls, having group shame of we're never going to have anything like this. We're n no one's ever going to look at us like we're an even person. And it, it, like my trouble started at, at that point of me looking at the world like no one's ever really going to see me. They're just going to see some dirty little girl whose mother's on welfare who can't wear nice shoes and has to get her clothes at the church. And I'm not whining. That was a great experience in hindsight. But, you know, how, that must have, was that how you felt too? Like, like people knew your story before they knew you. I'm sure. You no, know? with her, she just didn't fucking dig me. Some people just don't like people. And after, you know, like coming to the house was one thing. Moving in was another. You know, and I had invaded her home. I had, she had to put a bedroom away. And it was really weird. I didn't think about this till this summer because they have three boys and then they have a girl. And the girl had a daughter when we were kids, a legitimate, you know, and then now it, it's now she's big, you know. And when I went home after the longest shot, I showed up to do a comedy show and they were there. The daughter, the mother, and my friend growing up. The mother, too? Not the mother that hated me. The right. girl, you know, the brothers, the siblings. Right. And I was really surprised to see them there. And then the, the sister pulled me, the daughter pulled me aside. And she goes, listen, talk to John more. That was my buddy. She goes, he's really alone. John's a knucklehead. I love John dearly, but John was always a knucklehead. You know, he don't talk to his brothers. You know, him and his brothers had wars grow, going on. And it, it was just weird that they approached me. So I became friends with the girl on Facebook. So we keep in touch, and she was coming this summer, and I was going to come clean with her. You know, and I really thought about it for a week. What happened? I did some bad things, but what fucking happened? What was, what made me lash back at them? Like, and what really happened was, I'll tell my viewers what really happened. I robbed the sister's house. In a fucking haze, I robbed the sister's house, and there was rumors that it was me. They never really knew. And the first thing I'm going to do one day when I do get a bunch of money, is just give her cash and go, this is my gift to you. I'm sorry. It happened to her. There was nothing there. Right. Her boyfriend was dealing drugs at the time, and that's what happened. And uh, and they always knew, but they could never put their finger on it. And I wanted to tell the daughter that it was me. you know. But let me tell you, but they all knew that the mother was weird. The mother was weird to all of them. The mother was weird to all their kids. They never really had a good relationship with all the mothers. She's very cold as a mom. There's moms that are very cold growing up. She was one of them. Right. She was cold. She would call her kids stupid and shit like that, you know, now in hindsight. And that didn't give me the right to do what I did. But at fucking 16, I didn't know better. I thought that's how you backlash at somebody. Because I heard me and her were friends. Like, I was friends with all the boys and the girl. Right. I was friends with them. I grew up with them. When she got the apartment, before she started dating Creepy Crawler, I used to go over there at night and we would look at Playboys. She was older than me. She had big tits. I never fucked her or nothing, but she was like my older sister of sorts. Right. And then when I heard that she was talking about me with the mom, I got mad at her because she was like my older sister. 
I never had a sister. I got a sister in Cuba. I got stuck there. I never had a sister growing up. So this is my older sister. That mixed with the mother and all that shit fucking pissed me the fuck off. You know, when I went in there, I went in there looking for drugs. And uh, yeah. that's the fucking story. I'm coming clean right now on Beauty and the Beast podcast. This is what it's about. Yeah. I feel bad about those things. Sure, I fucking do. You know, if you think I don't, and that's part of my drive. When I wake up in the morning, it's to prove, listen, I came from a very supportive hometown, but I came from a hometown that is like any other hometown. You got 50% of the people saying, fuck yeah, and you got 50% of the people saying, fuck that motherfucker. He was always a thief, cocksucker anyway. What I'm trying to do is prove them wrong. You know what I'm saying? Every time I do a movie or something and I go home, it's like I'm proving them wrong again. Every time I do something, just me being alive past 35, I fucked them up. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it up. is amazing. <laughs> I fucked them up, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So now every morning when I get up, uh, I got an email from a buddy of mine that I have not spoken to since his brother died 31 years ago. I talked to his sister. You met his sister at the Beauty and the Beast event. She went up to him two years ago and said, do you remember Coco? And he's played it off like, no. And she's like, how the fuck don't you remember Coco? He was up and down the block with you growing up. And it, the memories were so hard for him because his brother died a year yeah. after my mom. Right. The memories were so hard for me and fucking... Monday, he my, Facebooked me. Oh, he did? And, and it took me four days, because I know it took him two years to do this. Right. I know it took him two years of thought. So what I did this morning, when he Facebooked me Monday, I called Vita, told Vita. She, she fell off a chair. She couldn't believe it. And then I wrote him back a note today saying that, hey, and at the end, I said, hey, I still think of your brother. I have his picture on my wall. And whenever I have a bad day, so-called what we think a fucking bad day is, I look at that picture, Felicia. And I go, he ain't having that bad day at all. You know, so yeah. what am I, oh, I didn't get a part. Oh, I didn't get my check from SAG, and I'm fucking complaining, you know. Where, where's this kid complaining about? He can't complain. He died at fucking 16, you know. Oh, someone sent a link uh, right, right, I seen for the link. Uh, uh, Black Sabbath. Was it 1967 or 1970? 70. 70, 70, I think, yeah. Sabbath started out as a band called Earth. Oh, really? Yeah, with Ozzy Osbourne, it was called Earth, and then they became Black Sabbath. The first album was great. I was a big Sabbath guy, and it was funny because I grew up a Stones guy, Led Zeppelin guy, Doors, you know, the general shit, the who. When I heard fucking Sabbath, when I heard War Pigs the first time, I lost my fucking mind. Oh, really? Oh, when I heard War Pigs the first time, you have no idea. How I knew, old were you when you heard that? Probably 12. I knew I had arrived. Yeah. I knew I had arrived. And then I bought, like, I think I bought Paranoid. And then I bought, uh, uh, the second album I bought was Black Sabbath, Black Sabbath, the first one, the summer of 79. Mm -hmm. And I took it down to Jersey Shore, way before Snooki was down there giving blowjobs. <laughs> uh, and then I got into this weird album called Sabotage. It's like their sixth album, because they had nine <coughs> albums. <coughs> Sorry. And it's really weird. If you know anything about Black Sabbath, they don't sing about, they sing about reality. That's why their third album is called Master Reality. I never got a tattoo, but if I was going to get a tattoo, it was going to be Coco on my fingers. Like right. Ozzy got me. Ozzy oh, had really? it on his fingers, yeah. <laughs> and they were great. I think I'm going to get that tattoo. I was going to get it. I went up there <laughs> to get Coco it. Coco right across there. And my anthem growing up, like when I was going through all that shit with the benders and all mm -hmm. that shit, for every day for 15 years, I listened to Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, because it's about revenge. Right. It's about, you know, uh, you bastard and all this shit. People have fucked with you and all that. And their lyrics are all about reality. Like, that's what they're about. Like, I remember one time on my birthday, I was about 17. I went to Union City. I bought THC Crystal. And I went home and put on Master Reality. I snorted the crystal and I watched The Exorcist. <laughs> and I thought my head was going to fucking blow. I remember looking around the room. Satan was on one side. Hitler was on the other. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it was just fucking yeah. crazy. But Black Sabbath is a very weird band. And I hate... Ozzy now because not that I hate him I never knew he would become what he'd become today like I still remember crying when Black Sabbath brought, I still remember going to see Sabbath when Van Halen was opening up for them in 78 and Van Halen blowing them off the fucking stage really? oh it was oh, it was really? it was it was fucking it was horrendous how bad oh, Sabbath really? it was my first time to see Sabbath I had just seen him on Don Kirst's rock and roll concert that comes on after Saturday Night Live uh -huh. you know and they did Never Say Die and that was their last album Never Say Die and I remember going to the garden it was like October 20th 19 fucking 79 or 78 something like 78 or something and i remember going there and seeing black sabbath and fucking they were horrendously bad but fucking van halen opened up with eruption and you never went to see an opening band those days never oh, right, right never never right. you always went into mission because you were cool but for some reason <laughs> it was the garden we were over there like at 8 15 
and Van Halen came out, but I'll never forget seeing uh, Bill Ward, the drummer, we were that close, mm -hmm. snorting coke off the drums. Like he was pouring it on the thing. Ozzy came out with a bottle of fucking vodka and started, this is when fucking rock stars really? are rock yeah. stars. Oh, Tony yeah. Iommi had no fingertips. When Tony Iommi, the guitar player, right. cut his, when he was a kid in a sheet metal factory, uh -huh. he cut his fingers off up right. here, the tips. So they had to make special tips for him. So Tony Iommi will never take a picture showing his fingers, you know? So it's just amazing. Yeah. But I really got taken over by Black Sabbath. The lyrics to their songs, just everything. I know every lyric, every song, every album. And then when Ozzy left the Sabbath, I mean, I was fucking heartbroken. Yeah. I was fucking heartbroken. I didn't know what to do. And uh, he left Sabbath. And uh, I, 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 uh, this fucking guy who just died took over, and they made a Heaven and Hell album. Mm -hmm. And we went to see him in Philadelphia, and they were so bad. Like, I, I like Ronnie James Dio. The album right. was great, but in person, he was too short. <laughs> he was like five foot one, and he didn't look like no devil yeah, to me. Yeah, you're like, Where's Aw. fucking Ozzy? And I remember I wore that shirt to Sabbath in Philadelphia. Where's Ozzy? But then I remember the week John Lennon got shot. I still remember going home. Mm -hmm. I, it was a Monday night, Monday night football, and I took a hit of acid. Uh, double barrel and I went home and Mr. Bender was awake and I'm sitting on the couch with Mr. Bender watching uh, watching the F Monday Night Football and uh -huh. all of a sudden they go ladies and gentlemen uh, we just got a report that John Lennon has been shot and I remember I was on acid I remember how I felt I was fucking amazing like I wanted to cry I love John Lennon yeah. I love the Beatles but yeah. I wasn't a Beatle kid growing up and I'll never forget that that week New York was I'd never seen New York like that. To describe yeah. New York City in the old days was, whenever I think of New York, I think of John Lennon dying, going to the city that Sunday and going into Central Park and smoking pot with people. And I remember going to the village and going to Bleak of Bob's. And while I was going through the albums, I found an Ozzy album that he had just released. And it was called The Blizzard of Oz. Right. This is how <laughs> fucked up I was on Coke. But what people don't know is in the fourth album, Ozzy put out a song called Snowblind, which is just brilliant. You know, it's just brilliant. Me and my friends used to snort coke and go to the cemetery <laughs> and lay there on tombs and just, are you getting high on this coke yet? We were fucked up right. on Black Sabbath. Did but you know I worked in a cemetery? Did I ever tell you that story? I, so did I. <laughs> <laughs> That's our common bond. <laughs> That's our common bond. <laughs> we both worked in cemeteries. But it's fucking crazy that, uh, like, I really liked everything he stood for, Ozzy Osbourne. I was there when Ozzy did the first tour in New York at the Palladium. I went with Rudy Sarzo, who was Alan... Alan's oh, yeah, friend. That's Alan's that friend. was his yeah. original band. It was yeah. Rudy Sarzo, uh, the kid who died on the guitar, and the drummer was some other fucking wackadoo. But that's the Blizzard <laughs> of Oz. And I bought the first album with the four songs on it. It only had four songs on it. Right. The first EP. In those days, they used to release EPs. Yeah. Rat released one, Missing Persons released one. They were just four song albums. And I'll never forget getting the Blizzard of Oz and going to see Ozzy. It was, you know, how many lines of coke I snorted to Black Sabbath, <laughs> just listening to Ozzy. A and, tremendous amount. <laughs> oh, technical ecstasy, never say die, Sabbath, right. bloody Sabbath. And now I look at Ozzy, and it's so weird because he's not Oz, he's Ozzy. Black Sabbath to me is John Osborne. That's who Black Sabbath is. It's yeah. really John Osborne was his well, real name. Well, back to this link, though. I mean, because I wasn't into uh, uh, Black, Black Sabbath, Sabbath right. quite like that. Like, you know, it wasn't my thing. I was trying to do, like, English bands at that time to impress the smart dudes. So, uh, but uh, <clears throat> watching it, you know, you forget uh, when you see Ozzy in 1970, you know what? He was pretty fucking precious. He was <laughs> you know? a bad you know motherfucker. What I, you Have know you ever thought saying? about your like, soul? Can it be saved? Or perhaps you, right. perhaps you think that when you are dead, you stay in your grave. Is that just the truth within your head, or is it part of you? Is is God just a name that you read in a book when you were in school? Da -da -da -da. Fucking after forever, baby. Joey Diaz, you, you know are how we fucking do it. <laughs> so for all you Black Sabbath heads out there, yeah. you got another one here, the real deal. No fucking okey doke motherfucker here. I'll go toe to toe. They're from Birmingham, England. They're industrial. Right. I mean, I go all the yeah. way back. With, and they're from the same town as Judas Priest. So yeah. that's another thing a lot of people don't fucking know either. Even though he was gay, throw on hell bent for leather and get back to me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> go home, throw on hell bent for leather and get yeah. back to a motherfucker. <laughs> you know, there's been a question I wanted to ask you. Uh, you. You're a pretty straight woman with me. You've always been very straight and you're very smart. I like that about you. I've always told the viewers this, or the listeners, have you ever considered, just, we're all honest here, have you ever made a sex tape? Oh, have I ever made a sex tape? Um, no, I've never made a sex tape. So your only appearance nude was in Playboy that time? 
Yeah, I'm pretty it's, sure. It's crazy because I was thinking about it the other night. And I was thinking about. Well, you know what I did once, and this I think about this story a lot in my life. When I was a stripper, when I was 18, um, I met this guy at the strip club, and he's like, "I'm an artist, and I, <coughs> excuse me, I'm an artist, and I uh, do a lot of sculpting and stuff like that. Uh, would you consider posing for me?" And I was like, "All right." And he had showed me some stuff that he did, and I was like 18 years old, and I uh, went over to his house. And I let him uh, take new pictures of me because he's like, I got to see your form. But he had other stuff there, too. Like, he did seem like he was an artist. And uh, and I remember he was like, I'm going to put plaster on you. And I was like, yeah, I'm not into the plaster thing. <laughs> you know? And I got a really creepy, terrible feeling. And I don't know how I talked myself out of it. But I, And it was in his fucking basement. I mean, it was like the lovely bones kind of shit, you know. And I left, and I, like think about that moment a lot in my life like you know like that what could have happened what could have happened he could have you know been the I mean? dude from fucking silence of the land and put you in a hole with no, a french poodle no it was like that kind of feeling you know like that scared the shit out of me but uh, i never did a, a live uh, video it's funny because i see i have you... sent my naked little body across a text though did quite you? a few times really oh absolutely uh, it's funny because <laughs> I, I i talk to you all the time and the other day i was thinking about you as a, a sexually free woman. We do this podcast, and I tell you, I have no judgment towards you whatsoever. I love you to death. I've always loved a woman who kisses and tells. I don't want to know who you told, right? but don't let me find out and come to you and go, Felicia, you really fucked this guy? And you're like, no, we didn't fuck. That shit has always bothered me about some women. I, it's out of the bag. But you're here's the thing, though. As a, a woman that... I had a bad reputation at the comedy store, and uh, and it would always be about the wrong people. Like, dude, you don't have any idea who I'm fucking. Right, <laughs> you know what I mean? right, right. I'll so, talk about fucking, and I'll talk, but I don't name names. You no, know what I it's mean? just so weird that you've always been very. There's some women that you know their strokes. You know, when you're eating breakfast and the woman's like, "I love to fuck," that bitch is a fucking moron. She's just throwing shit out there. She really don't know. Right. I just seen this two weeks ago at a comedy really? club. Yeah, some people Jay, just don't I know. Like to fuck. But you're a, you're a different type. When I when you talk to me about this shit, and usually if I'm at a bar or any other guy, every guy will tell at home. Right. If you're at a bar and some woman talks to you, the way all the things that Felicia says in front of me, I would leave to your horned up. Well, here's the thing: I can t say whatever the fuck I want uh, in front of an audience. That's what's weird to me. But then I am in real life. I'm kind of shy. Like you know. Yeah, like, you're real I fucking am. shy. I know. Shut up. Fuck you, I'm shy. <laughs> yeah, she's shy. Fuck you, I'm shy. I'm fucking believable. You came eight you know? times two weeks ago, no, but you're fuck fucking shy. Fuck you, Joey. <laughs> Linda Lovelace didn't come eight times and fucking, and you come eight times, but you're fucking shy. You think somebody comes once, they ain't fucking shy. Oh. But it's just so weird how I have a lot of respect for you as a woman. We were talking about something outside that you looked at me. There's a lot of things people don't know about me. I say bitch and I say cunt. And I say all these fucking words, but my respect level for women is very high. I just grew up in that environment. I say those words. It's not really what I feel sometimes. And it's so weird that there's a word that destroys me inside. Baby mama. <laughs> fucking is over. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know yeah. you're shy. You're not going to say that. <laughs> Baby's mama. I know. I'm all mad at Joey <laughs> yeah. now. <laughs> Baby's mama is like no disrespect to a woman. Oh, you, you just had a don't kid like with. the term. I don't, I don't like the word. There's got to be something better for me yeah. than that. My ex-girlfriend, anything will work. Yeah. My ex-woman, anything will work for me than baby's mom. And it's so weird. Like, I think about little things like that. Like, you come online here, you were a stripper. I mean, you love sex. I mean, I could tell when you talk to me, you really like sucking a dick. You like fucking. You like it. It's, 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 it's a challenge. Wait, you love but it. You know, but you know what? Here's the thing. Though, and you're Joey, comfortable in your sexuality, which is another thing I love. I comfortable in my sexuality. But you know what? I have to say, like, when I was uh, doing comedy the first time around, uh, uh, people got mad at me because I was very open about talking about sex. And you know what I mean? Like, people got, got really weird about it. And it started to make me feel like, like maybe I'm basing my, all my comedy on my looks, and and then I cut my hair and I dyed it brown, and I went through like this weird funky phase of like I should suppress that, you know? I don't have any value if I'm saying these things and I look like I can throw a blowjob, you know what I mean? That's not, you know what I mean? That's not really a reflection of society, you know? I would get all, like so fucked up, and I was thinking today before you came over about how. Uh, that, that sex, even though I'm very open about it, how it's kind of fucked me up too uh, because people make you feel guilty that you're a sexual being. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I would never do way. that to you. I'm just saying here that with all your sexual experiences, I mean, I've And had, I am shy. Fuck you. Oh, stop. <laughs> I've had sexual experiences in my life that, and I'm really fucking 
I'm not even shy about it. I'm like prudish in a way. That's why for years I talked about it on stage because it's funny to me. Sex was fucking funny to me, you know? Like it's so funny in so many fucking levels to me that people don't see. I've seen it. Yeah. Because other people look at it as love and I'm like, there ain't nothing loving about that when I'm fucking you and we're both sweating and I'm coming on your titties. Love got nothing. Love don't live here no more, bitch. <laughs> you know? And it's, you don't do all that stuff with love? You don't come on a girl's titties. Yeah, when I pull your hair and fucking put my cock in your mouth angry, I do that out of love. Yeah. I do that out of fucking love. I do that because. We take that out of love. Because some teacher in the fourth grade hit me with fucking. Oh, in the. Whatever. I do that out of love. It's weird, but some people say love making, and I'm like, love. I've never felt nothing when somebody's on top of me bouncing up and fucking down, you know, and you're looking at them and you're looking at their tits. And I usually giggle like a kid. Yeah, I'm a kid. When I see a woman, like, I fucking giggle, you know, because I'm an asshole like that. I, you know. But it's just so, out of all the things you've done, you never considered one. Like, I respect you in a way for it. Like, you never considered one. Oh, never. doing a sex film? Yeah, like, I know guys have asked you, hey, no, no, not a sex film, but, hey, we've been together three They're years. sex films. That's what they are. Okay, whatever. It's a sex film. Uh, I don't mean it for people to watch. I mean, just you and him. Let's fuck on camera. Let's watch it like a comedy set. Let me see what I'm doing wrong. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Something like that. I don't know. I don't know. I I've asked people. No, I've never done that. Like guys, uh, I've had guys, uh, you know, text me, you know. Right, pictures of their dicks and shit like that. Right. That's why the Brett Favre thing, you, didn't we talk about that? Yes. Yeah, already. Well, he sent this picture. To, I, I would be embarrassed. Like after I sent the picture with my dick. Have you ever done that? No, I, but I've done other You've things with my dick. Uh, yes. You know what I'm saying? I've You've hidden it. things from the DEA with your dick? Yeah. I, I remember going, I remember I used to go to Dunkin' Donuts as a kid. And you go up to the glass and you uh -huh. put your dick in the glass and you tell a lady to go underneath and get a chocolate eggclair or something when she bends over, your dick's in the glass. Like, I've done some fucked up shit with my dick. You know what I'm saying? I put it on top of a counter at Burger King oh. and demanded a Whopper. Oh, you know. no. I've, I've done some fuck. Now I'm going to look at my, my kids a little closer. Yeah, because you do shit with your dick. Once you just, and, and I was uncircumcised, so I knew I was different from other kids. So I don't have a problem showing my dick ever. I'll show my dick and balls, and people are like, oh, my God, look at those ball sacks. Like, whatever. I don't give a fuck. I put my balls. Listen, my balls are sag. Your balls are sag? A lot of people don't know this. I did. If you ever watch Nick Swanson's video, Shaving My Pubes, if you ever see it, go on YouTube. There's a video of, of Nick Swanson shaving his pubes or something. I don't know the name of the song. He the, did a the song. The Comedian? Yeah, he did a Nick song. Nick Schwartzen? Nick Schwartzen yeah. did a song oh, okay. years ago. And this is a very funny story. I was working on the longest show. I were towards the end. There were like three weeks left to work. And I'm in my trail. I'm probably high. I'm watching some video. And I get a knock on the door, and it's one of Adam's boys. And he comes up to me. He's like, hey, Adam wants to talk to you real quick. I thought they were going to fire me because I was always doing something fucking wrong on that right. movie. So I go to meet Adam. And if you don't know Adam, and I hate to talk about this because it feels like I'm dropping names, but the story is very funny. You know, he sits down and his assistant was there and he's like, Joey, I need a big favor from you. Because during the filming in New Mexico, they had me in shorts and my balls would pop out of the shorts. Right. And he would say, Joey, put that speed bag away, right? So he would always <laughs> say that to me, put that speed bag away. So, <laughs> so he goes, Joey, I need a big favor from you today. And he didn't even look at me when he said this because it was just so funny. He goes, listen, Nick Swanson's making a video and he wants to know if he could use your balls for the video. And I'm like... You know, he's, he's looking around the room. He's not even talking to me. And I'm like, sure, I'll do anything for Nick. He's like, yeah, yeah, we'll get you in a few hours. <laughs> so cool let me that? clarify that. So Adam Sandler's asking me you. Me, yeah. if I could shoot a video for Nick showing my balls. Right. And I go, yeah. He goes, no problem, no problem. He goes, we'll take care of you on the check, whatever. I go, all right, no problem. So I go back to my fucking green, whatever, my room. And all of a sudden, I get a knock, and I open up, and they're there with a golf cart. And they're like, come on, we're going to take this picture. And I'm like, let's go. And I thought it was just like a picture. They took me to like Studio 12. <laughs> like they shot Spider-Man 2 at Studio 13. <laughs> but they take me to Studio 12 and there's four guys and there's like a, there's like a girl there and they got lights, but they got the camera like at my waist and mm -hmm. they got like something around this. So I got to take my balls. And I remember holding my dick and taking my balls out <laughs> and just, and they're like cut. And I'm like standing there with my balls in my hand. <laughs> And I'm like, Adam, come here. And he comes over, like, oh, my balls sag now. And he started howling. He was, right. I mean, nobody could even look at this. Like, nobody right. could even imagine <laughs> that somebody would be that crazy to hold their dick up and let their balls just hang there. And he's loving it the whole time. He's fucking loving it. He's, he, right. he loves all that crazy right. shit. Right. But it's so weird. Like, weeks later, somebody calls me. Like, I forgot I even did it. Somebody calls me, like, Joey. We just seen somebody who's got big balls just like you. And I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, yeah. Have you seen Nick Swanson's video? <laughs> Whosever balls those are are huge. I'm like, they're mine.
again, thank you motherfuckers for listening as usual. I love you guys with all my heart. Today was a very fun-filled episode. Yeah. I'm happy we got everything on that we needed to. And we'll uh, talk to you guys next week. Again, email us, beautyandthebeastpodcast at gmail.com. Felicia, give them a kiss. Mm-hmm. I love you guys. See you next week. <laughs>